uh, thought, thought Butler is simply one of uh, a whole variety of what he uh, calls mental propensities. Propensities of the mind. In other words, we were made with certain capacities, tendencies. As he says, God-given tendencies. Tendencies which, as they function, uh, provide this moral sense. Now, these uh, four kinds of propensity are, first of all, uh, particular passions, uh, where he seems to be speaking particularly of desires. Desires for satisfaction. And so the, the feelings, the emotions, the desires associated with hunger, with sex, with anger, okay, particular desires for particular objects. Um, a propensity as well for self-love, that's the self-interest. A propensity for benevolence, it's loving others. And the fourth propensity that he calls conscience. Now, self-love and benevolence provide rational checks on our passions. So that out of self-interest, you'll check your overindulgence. Out of benevolence, you'll bridle in your anger. So forth. Conscience, on the other hand, is the uh, propensity to balance uh, self-love and benevolence. You see, if you've got two principles, self-love and benevolence, uh, trying to guide the passions, um, having no self-love isn't going to be dominant. And you're going to turn out as a thoroughly selfish kind of animal. Yes, also, utterly selfless, you can't function. Well, that's where conscience uh, maintains the balance in choosing ends and means to pursue to those ends. Uh, conscience is both cognitive in the sense that um, it helps us to perceive, okay, to see what the right balance is, but it's also authoritative in that it approves or disapproves. You see? It motivates you, and it's out of this authoritative aspect of conscience, what a teacher of mine used to call the conscience prick. The conscience, your conscience pricks you. It's out of that conscience prick, you see, that the ought helps. Well, this is another kind of moral psychology, very, very similar to David Hume's, uh, with perhaps uh, two differences in the case of Butler. Uh, one is its emphasis is on the, the rational dimension, the cognitive dimension of the moral sense, called conscience. And the second is the fact that the propensities, the um, makeup of the human psyche, the propensities of the mind, passions, and so forth, um, are intended by God to function in a certain way. So the virtuous person is one in whom they function in that best way possible. A proper functioning human being is a virtuous human being. That sounds like Aristotle. Remember Aristotle's conception of the good as happiness is the proper functioning of a rational being in a whole life. You see, the functioning of a whole life in accordance with reason. So um, it seems to have um, an Aristotelian flavor, but it's a moral psychology of, of this sort. Okay, well maybe um, that's enough of a glimpse for now of the uh, moral sense philosophers. Um, they, they used to be the, the object of a great amount of study. Um, they're of interest now more as um, historical reactions against people like Hume and Hobbes, um, more as anticipations of 20th century ethical intuitionism, more as uh, starting the debate on cognitive versus emotive, non-cognitive ethics. Okay. But interesting and significant people. I think one of the things which they, um, which they do is to help us see that uh, an ethical subjectivism, okay, an ethic grounded on uh, moral psychology, an ethical subjectivism is, um, is, can be a um, provided universal as against relative ethic. That's so in Hume, but it's even more so, I think, in these people. You might um, wonder about the biblical use of the term conscience. Um, I'm inclined to think that um, Butler has packed a lot more into the word conscience than the New Testament does. Where, um, if I'm not mistaken, the, the word itself, uh, which is um, synodesis, um, the verb ideo and the preposition sun together with, um, means simply um, the ability to see things together, to put two and two together and make judgments. Yes, um, the, um, yeah, the French word for consciousness is simply conscience. Consciousness is conscious. You see, it's simply there is a capacity to make judgments, to see, put two and two together. And uh, it seems to me that that root meaning is, meaning is pretty close to the biblical use of the term. Conscience certainly isn't the infallible kind of Pinocchio stuff that uh, mythology has. It's something that can be blurred and very inaccurately informed. Well, in any case, um, Butler goes further than that, I think. It doesn't seem like, uh, it seems to me that he, he still answers the question of why, and uh, I guess it's more cognitive. It shouldn't be an answer for why. Uh, yeah, yeah I, th I think it's there in several ways. Um, one is this. Um, these are God-given with the purpose of providing moral direction. Therefore, ought equals God says do it. You see? And the, the other is down here with regards to disapprove or disapprove. You see, because if this, um, this moral sense is um, a capacity for making moral judgments, you see, this is okay, pass his master, that's awful, don't do it. You see, then it's intrinsic in that very um, uh, approbation, sense of approbation, disapprobation. Yeah. So the way in which you are made to function cries out its uh, command. Yeah, I, I think that's the way he'd, uh, he'd respond to that. You know, and if you find that um, a little bit odd, 
I find it hard to credit. Um, ask yourself, um, you know, if there's anybody here, or for that matter, get a much larger audience, any sort of mixed audience, anybody here who um, morally approves of torturing innocent infants for sheer sadistic delight of watching them scream in torment and watching their mothers go crazy in anguish. Mm -hmm. well, obviously, there are some things that every human being is going to revolt against. Well, it's that sort of psychological phenomenon that underlies us. Maybe there are exceptions to that. Like yeah, yeah. You know, then the question arises: What do you do with some of these exceptions? You just find other cases where they're benevolent, you see. Or do you, in those cases, say, as I think Butler would, there's something that's not functioning right. You see, and we have that way of talking about it in uh, moral psychology today. We say there are certain people who, for whatever reasons, are morally non-functional. They just have no capacity of uh, saying right and wrong. They have no moral sensitivity at all. That apparently, for whatever psychological, biological reasons. Try. I'm wondering how soon, especially not so much as most of us, how they can get a substantial, I mean, a normative universal ethic out of. The content of it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a very apt question. Um, but um, I think as with any other question asking about, you know, what's relevant and what's universal, you have to distinguish. Do you mean, uh, would they all handle these cases in exactly the same way, a particular case? Are you talking about a particular case? Are you talking about uh, general rules with regards to areas of responsibility, like a rule against killing? Which may be exceptions in some cases, but a rule against killing. Or are you talking of exceptionless principles, like um, the principle of benevolence? Yes, um, because uh, whatever the basis on which the principles lie, you see, the relativism is going to occur at some of these. You see. And I think that what these moral sense philosophers are saying is that what is plainly universal is there. Overall moral principles like benevolence. You see. Like a limited self-interest. Those are overall moral principles, which generate um, general rules. No, no, what constitutes it is doing what you believe to be good for other people and doing it out of the wish to do good. Right, but what you believe to be good is subjective. Ah, yeah, but you see, uh, what you believe to be good is going to depend on a lot of cases in any ethic. Take the commandment, thou shalt not kill. What is killing? Does it, does it include eating chicken? Does it include um, cutting the grass? You see? No, you've got to define it. You see? And defining it in context, in the case of the commandment, it's plain that to the general rule against killing, there are exceptions that are allowed in the Levitical context for various reasons. So that's a matter of specification. But you see, ethical relativism says there are no universal principles at all. The um, definition of ethical relativism which you get in um, or a selection from Ruth Benedict that's in the introductory text that I use uh, defines ethical relativism as the, um, the view that uh, um, all environmental conditions. Well, that's not a definition of ethical relativism which any ethicist will accept. You see, because we recognize that there are situational differences, depending on economic conditions and climate and so on and so forth in terms of some beliefs and practices. Nobody's going to claim that all the detailed beliefs and practices are universally the same. Biblically, the classic example of that is that business of eating food off the idols. You see, that's a cultural concern depending on the context and so on and so forth. Um, no, so uh, the relativist is going to say that all of these are relative. Now, you'll get a very legalistic absolutist like some of the Reconstructionists who will try to make out all the way through to here is absolute. You see. But it seems to me that uh, biblical ethics is laying emphasis here. Um, what does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love mercy as you walk humbly with your God, and then spells that out with regards to general areas uh, as in the Decalogue, to, to, to which in particular cases there may be some tragic exceptions, as with capital punishment in the Old Testament. So, on, so. so um, I, I think um, if you ask the moral sense philosophers what is absolute, and if they can sustain simply the overall principle of benevolence and a limited egoism, then to, in that regard they have broken with relativism. Yes, you yes, also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you also. May not have done it in the way you would like him to, but he's done it. Yeah. No, I think it's an oversimplification of a Christian ethic to say in a Christian ethic that everything is absolute, that's just not true. That's not the case. Ours is a limited absolute, isn't it, I call it. Yeah. Um, all right, anything else uh, on this moral sense philosophy? Oh, I, I should say that um, people like Butler and so forth, as they work it out, will try to derive general rules and apply them to cases. And in the instance of C.D. Broad, the, the guy I heard uh, some years back, um, his tendency, you say, with general principles in mind, was to address a particular case. And as he went through it and came to one stage in the decision-making process, after reviewing all of the considerations, he'd say, well, it seems to me in the light of this principle that it's perfectly obvious that such and such is the thing to do. Yeah. Um, now let, me, let me say just one thing more about this moral sense intuition approach. Um, it strikes me that there are two different kinds of ethical intuitionism or moral sense philosophy uh, cutting the cake in yet a different way. There is one kind that makes out the overall principles to be known intuitively by this moral sense. There is another that makes out that um, what you do in a particular case becomes evident to the moral sense. And then I suppose there would be some that combine the two. The 20th century intuitionists, I think, are speaking of this. It's the overall principles that are known intuitively. I think Butler and the moral sense people are, but they may go on as well to the particular cases. I mentioned G.E. Moore as a 20th century intuitionist. He says that the, the concept of good is an intuitive notion. That's his principle. Uh, what you to do in a particular case, for more, that's a utilitarian decision. It's not intuitive. It's what maximizes the good. That's it. Oh, well, let's start with the ethical theory course for some of you next year. Okay, let me um, clean this off a little bit. Now, um, turn our attention to um, 
David Hume's epistemology and the response of Scottish realism. Um, one of the questions which may have been lurking in the back of your mind, or perhaps filling up the front of your mind uh, last week, um, how to avoid David Hume's skepticism. Um, granted the skeptical conclusion that he draws from the theory of ideas, the representational theory of knowledge, is skepticism the inevitable result, logically? And is Hume's psychology of belief the only way to avoid that being the ultimate conclusion? Is his psychology of belief the only way out? Well, um, let me um, mention five attempts um, that develop in post-Hume thinking to handle this epistemological issue. Now, one of them undoubtedly is Hume's. Uh, that is to say, a psychology of belief that um, has a pragmatic basis for belief. Uh, that is to say, there are certain things it just plain works to belief. It works psychologically to belief. Uh, in fact, um, insofar as the um, passions take their usual course, it would be the most natural thing in the world to believe. And so following this psychology of belief, uh, what emerges then is a kind of pragmatism, um, a kind of psychology of belief that leads to pragmatism or uh, that is parallel to pragmatism. Now, various people I have in mind here, uh, the most obvious case is William James, uh, the American pragmatist. Um, some of you may have run into his essay called The Will to Believe. If you haven't, you probably will sometime. Um, in which he simply argues that if on a given issue there is no clear weight of evidence or argument on one side or the other, you turn to passional grounds for belief, passional in the human sense. That is to say, to non-cognitive grounds. And so belief then becomes simply an outcome of one's own psychological makeup. It's not at all clear whether for James he intends that to be a universal or a relative psychological makeup, and it seems that in some essays he says one, in some essays he says the other. But um, at least belief is a function of psychological makeup, um, the pragmatic route. Um, an earlier kind of psychology of belief than William James and is less pragmatic is John Henry Newman in the 19th century in Oxford, who wrote a book called A Grammar in Aid of Assent. A Grammar in Aid of Assent. Uh, I think the um, paperback that's still in print goes under the title A Grammar of, of Assent. Simply that. Well, what uh, he does really is to make a distinction between uh, two kinds of certainty that he calls certainty and certitude. Certainty and certitude. Where certainty has to do with logical certainty, demonstrative certainty. And uh, certitude has to do with psychological certainty. As you might expect, he argues for the certitude rather than the certainty on this matters. Um, okay, that's, um, that's one route, a somewhat pragmatic um, psychology of belief. The view that there are some beliefs which psychologically are unavoidable. Psychologically are unavoidable. Logically, they may be avoidable, but psychologically they're not. Now, um, you'll find that uh, something of that note runs through a lot of later realists in addition to the Scottish realists. Um, you'll find them um, saying, for instance, that uh, if somebody doesn't believe in the reality of the external world, material things, you offer them a glass of arsenic and see what they do. Um, <laughs> things of that sort. Um, obviously, um, their disbelief is not a disbelief they live with. Um, G.E. Moore says one time of a Scottish idealist who had said that uh, time is unreal. That apparently, um, when he says that he had breakfast before he lectured, he didn't mean it at all. Before? Yes, um, he didn't mean that at all. Well, what did he mean? And obviously, the very pragmatics of language and action are such that there are certain affirmations we make in the process. And it's paradoxical if people deny when they speak what in action they affirm. So the pragmatic is involved with the practical dimensions, the unavoidabilities in practice. Um, a second obvious alternative is to reject the um, representational theory. You know, the view that we found in Descartes and Locke and following, that the direct object of our thought is simply ideas. And if we want to refer to anything extra mental, we have to have proofs that they exist. Now, um, that notion that ideas keep us distanced from realities would mean, uh, it would be the representational theory. And the alternative is to reject that. Uh, to maintain, in other words, a kind of direct awareness, a direct realism. <coughs> direct realism. And that is precisely what these Scottish realists do. They reject the representational theory, the theory of ideas, explicitly.